but finally to end things off the best rapper of the 2020s is hello today i'm going to be giving my top 50 rap artists of the 2020s i'm basing this off of total artistry and obviously also only music that came out this decade starting with number 50 i'm gonna have Offset. Now, I'm not gonna lie, Offset, not the first name I think of when I think of top 50 rappers of the decade, but when I looked into it a bit more, he did release a pretty solid project this decade, Set It Off, which had some great features, especially that Travis Scott feature. Also, in general, you had some very hype production that matched really well with Offset's energetic mic presence, and while I don't think the highs on this album are great enough to put him any higher on this list, I do think he squeaks in here. 49, I have Polo G, and he's a bit of a mixed bag. On the one hand, he has albums like Hall of Fame, which, very disappointing in my opinion, got very repetitive, boring, felt like he needed to switch it up a bit more. Um, but then you have albums like The Goat, which had some very catchy hooks and really made me a, a bigger fan of Polo G before it kind of fell off a bit. He's one of those people where I feel like if he doesn't turn it around, if he doesn't switch it up, I, I think he'll definitely fall off this list in a year, maybe two. 48th place, I have Young Thug. He released Punk, which I thought was definitely a mixed bag. Some of it was a bit too much for me. Um, but then he released Business is Business, which I thought was very underrated and did not get the love it deserved. It was a pretty consistent track list. He had a lot of Metro Boom in production, which usually doesn't fail. But once again, I don't think the highs are really high enough. 47, we have Quavo, another member of the Migos. Who would have thought? Honestly, not me. But he also released a good solo project that honestly I thought was even a bit better than Set It Off. But on top of that, he had an entire other collab album with Takeoff, only built for Infinity Links. Obviously, Takeoff, Quavo, they have great chemistry. And it's just more of the same hype production with energetic delivery. I'm about to make DJ Academics cry because at 46, I do have Drake barely sneaking onto this list. But I mean, that man has dropped three mid at best albums this decade he's been thinking quantity over quality for a long time first off you got honestly never mind very boring it's pretty much just background music then you got certified boy lover and fat d now i'm not gonna lie there's a few songs here and there that i think are pretty good but for the most part it's it's boring it's trash it's cringe you got songs like way too sexy you got songs like uh, rich baby daddy which is sexy red absolutely ruined i'm also just getting tired of drake talking the way he talks about girls and all that stuff when he's like 40 and has a child I'm, I'm a little over it i am same thing with like future it's just it gets a bit tiring now you might be saying why is drake even on this list you just trashed him quite a bit you do have you do have albums like her loss which i think is a fantastic collab album i think 21 savage and drake have great chemistry together they both bring out a lot in each other that they can't necessarily do on their own. Drake could get a lot more aggressive. 21 Savage, it's the opposite. He could get a lot more lighthearted, get into that love bag a bit more, and it feels natural, it feels good. Also, even though Drake lost the beef against Kendrick Lamar, I actually found it kind of helping him in this uh, in this video, in this ranking, because at the end of the day, Family Matters, Push Ups were still great songs, where, I mean, I think, especially Family Matters, had some of Drake's best rapping in a long time. Number 45, Childish Gambino. Asta Vista was a complete mess, even when he did revise it. But Band of Stone in the New World, I thought was great. I made a video on that entire album, ranking every song from it. So if you want to go check that out, go ahead. Number 44, I have Mick Jenkins. And before I explain that one, I'm going to try and go a bit quicker because I don't want this video being like 40 minutes long. And it will be if I keep yapping. So Mick Jenkins, uh, he released The Patience. The Patience was a great listen. He is a fantastic lyricist, pretty underrated. Number 43, I'm going to have Larry June. He's released a couple of projects in the 2020s, but The Great Escape, I think, was his best one. You got Alchemist type production, um, which really matches his smoothed out voice very well. I love his rapping style. It's just so relaxing without sounding like background music, like a <clears throat> Drake. Number 42, I have an up and comer, Red Veil. I'm very excited for the rest of his career. I think he has a chance to explode in popularity. He's got bars. I love his flows. I love his production choices. Learn to Swim was a great album. PG Baby, fantastic song. One of my favorite songs of 
like what, 2023 was when that album came out? No, 2022, I think. For number 41, I have Rhapsody, which is definitely a bit of a surprise because, you know, she's older, not as prevalent now, but she released one of my favorite albums of this year, 2024. Very emotional listen. She covers a lot of topics. You know, one of those being like um, dealing with Alzheimer's, not that she is Alzheimer's, like one of her loved ones. Um, and it's just, yeah, it's a very open album. She delivers a lot of bars to the point where like, I hear something and I go like, wow. She does a lot of name dropping, which also keeps it exciting. Very, very good listen. And that alone puts her on this list. Number 40, I have Lil Baby. This is a guy who I don't expect to be here um, later on in this decade. I think he's already started falling off and I think it will continue just because he's not going to be able to really change his sound enough and it'll get tiring. I think it already has. But for now, he's still living off of the hype of my turn, which was one of the biggest albums of the decade so far. Also, it's worth mentioning that Lil Baby had a great feature run from like 2020 to, I'd say like 2022, 2023. Where he really was just very consistent. He did not have a bad feature. For 39, I have Earl Sweatshirt. He is more of an acquired taste. He's a part of that more monotone style of rap. But with that comes a lot of bars, which I enjoy. In terms of his albums, he released two in the 2020s, I'm pretty sure. Um, one of those being Sick, which I thought was just okay. But then the other one being Voir Dear, which I very much enjoyed and was one of my favorite albums of last year. At number 38, I do have Kanye. I feel like some people are going to be upset he was even on this list. And then other people are going to be mad that he wasn't higher on this list. So that sucks. But at the end of the day, he has two projects this decade, right? You got Vultures 1 and Donda. Donda, was it a bit bloated? Yes, but the highs were really high. I thought it was a good album. Then you got Vultures 1, which I did enjoy at first for like a minute, and then I got sick of it because how much of Kanye's cringe can you really take before you're just over it? A perfect example of that is Carnival. Um, he just got too cringe. He was spewing out nonsense for half that album. So while there were some songs I liked, it was very flawed album. Then you got Kanye's Features. Not good. I don't know what's going on with that, but Kanye has not been able to deliver a good feature in like two or three years. It's crazy. So while Donda does put him on this list, Vultures won and his features have put him lower on this list. Next I have Juice World, and honestly, he's really similar to Kanye in this case in the sense that both of them have one good album and then one not so good project in this decade. Legends Never Die, fantastic posthumous album, but then Fighting Demons, you could definitely tell the vault was getting a little bit more dry. The only reason why I do have Juice World one, one spot above Kanye is because Juice World didn't have a horrible feature run like Kanye did. Now I have Future at 36. He released a lot of projects in the 2020s, but I do once again feel like it was a bit of a mixed bag. You have I Never Liked You, which I don't think was a bad album, but it was definitely stale and boring at points. I feel like in general, sometimes Future's biggest problem is just that he's phoning in his verses and he's too subdued. With that being said, we don't trust you. One of my favorite albums from this year. The production is phenomenal. The features are phenomenal. You have some of the biggest highlights in music from this year on that album. We Still Don't Trust You, on the other hand, is very bloated. I think the second half is great. I think the first half, not so great, where he does more of that Hendrix-style feel. At number 35, I have Don Tolliver. He could do so much with his voice. He could go higher. He could go lower. He could go on a more hype track, a more subdued track. There's a lot he could do. He has quite a bit of versatility, which I do tend to enjoy. Now, in terms of his albums and his curation, I think he struggles a little bit on Lovesick. I thought he fell into that kind of background music sort of problem, but I thought Hearthstone Psycho was great. Life of a Don I thought was pretty good. Overall, I think he's hit more times than he's missed. For number 34, I have Joey Badass, who unlike Future, Don Tolliver hasn't released nearly as much, only one album, but that was 2000, and it was one of my favorite albums of 2022, I believe is when it came out. At the end of the day, Joey Badass is a top tier lyricist with great flows. He could get melodic when he wants to, and he always seems to have great production choices. Schoolboy Q is the next rapper on this list, and he's another guy who only released one album, but that one album was so good that he still deserves to be here. Blue Lips, I've said this in a couple of my short form content videos, it's my album of the year up to this point at least. The production is fantastic. There's so many highlight beat switches and obviously Schoolboy Q can rap too. I have Mac Miller at 32 and he's another guy who I did not expect to be here just cause I don't really think of him as like a 2020s rapper, but Circles did release in 2020 and for that alone, he deserves to be here. He really does. Circles 
is one of the best posthumous albums ever, in my opinion. It's so open and honest and emotional and heartbreaking, but beautiful at the same time. There's so many tracks I'm still going back to. It's a absolutely amazing album, and for it to be a posthumous album just makes it even more impressive. Out 31, we're getting to the Griselda guys. We got Conway, The Machine. Now, I will say a big problem with like, or I mean, it's not a big problem, but just a gripe I have sometimes with all the people that came from Griselda is they just released too many albums. Like pretty much all of them or all the main ones, you know, West Side Gun, um, Conway, Benny the Butcher, they released like eight albums so far in the 2020, they like release three albums every year or at least projects. Maybe they're not all albums. Um, and that just makes me a bit tired of it all. You could be a fantastic rapper, but if you're releasing that much, eventually the music's going to get a bit more bland. So that's the only gripe I have. But at the end of the day, like literally everyone from Griselda is such a top tier rapper and one of like the better lyricists in the entire genre. And we're staying with Griselda because at 30, I have Benny the Butcher. I just think his albums have been a little bit better than Conway's overall. I think his highs have been higher for sure. Now I have Pusha T. What's so impressive about him is that he could combine these hard hitting verses and bars with these really catchy and at times melodic hooks, which usually those two things do not go together. They don't mix, but Pusha T makes it work. And that is I mean, really, I'm always impressed by that. He released It's Almost Dry, which fantastic production. You had Pharrell and Kanye working on it, so it really couldn't fail in that regard. I thought the features were pretty good too. He even had a good Kanye feature, which I mean, is very rare at this point. Next up, we got Stove God Cooks, and he's a little bit less known, only really released one major album in this decade, and that was Reasonable Drought, and even that wasn't that popular, but the quality was there. In general, Stove God Cooks just has a lot of potential. He really just has to release more music, but he has one of the most unique voices, especially when he gets into that melodic bag. He's very versatile. He can genuinely sing, but also deliver these like punchline bars while he's rapping. Number 27, I have Ice Cold Bishop, and he's really similar to Stove God Cooks in a lot of ways. Both of them are newer into their career. They don't have a lot of material out, but what they do have is fantastic. The best way I could describe Ice Cold Bishop is he's a mixture of the best of Danny Brown and Kendrick Lamar all put into one, and that just creates for a rapper with so much in his arsenal. I mean, the amount of different flows and voices and moods that this rapper has makes his music never get old. Granted, he doesn't have a lot out, so we have to see if it gets a bit more stale, but like, I can't see how that happens. His vocal range is ridiculous. There's just so many tools he can use that make that makes his music always exciting and refreshing and completely unique. Now there's Baby Keem, who is also very new into his career, has a very unique voice, can get very melodic when he wants to. All, all three of these rappers are like in the same boat of just so having so much potential really i want all of all three of these guys need to drop more music very soon because like the sky is the limit for baby keem i mean there's just not many people that sound like him his quirkiness makes him stand out the melodic blue was a fantastic debut album he is a great rapper at 25 pop smoke people don't talk about him enough if i'm being honest like his influence off rip was insane. He started making music and then everyone wanted to sound like him who was in New York and made drill music. And I think a major reason for that was because his voice was just instantly recognizable. He was genuinely starting to genre bend and take take a genre like drill where usually that coincides with very aggressive music, but then take these R&B elements to create like these love drill songs. Very, very impressive. In terms of albums, he released Shoot for the Stars, Aim for the Moon, which was a good listen. And honestly, it's just really unfortunate that we can't see, you know, what he could have done in the future. Number 24, I have Black Thought. He's one of the best lyricists of all time. And in all time list, he's much higher. But in the 2020s, somehow, he's still releasing some great music. Cheat Codes, fantastic album. Glorious Game, fantastic album. And he hasn't lost any of his lyrical ability. For 23, I have Killer Mike. And he's 
another great lyricist, but the main reason why he's here is because he released Michael last year, which had just amazing production, great beat switches, great rapping, had one of the best songs of the year in Scientists and Engineers, featuring Andre 3000 and Future. The features in general were great. It was a top tier album of last year. Got so much unreasonable hate because of everything that happened at the Grammys, but nonetheless, he deserves to be here because of that album. Next is Boldy James. He's another one of those monotone style rappers and he's released a bunch of quality projects throughout the decade so far. But the best one is his most recent one in my opinion. Penalty of Leadership came out this year. It was in my top five rap albums of 2024. I don't know if it still is. A lot has come out since then, but regardless, it's a great listen with that Alchemist style production. It's not by the Alchemist, but it's the same sort of thing. And I just never get tired of those types of beats. Now I did not do this on purpose, but at 21, I do have 21 Savage who I can't lie has like consistently been proving me wrong. I kind of thought for a long time that 21 Savage was gonna fall off because I think he needed to change up his sound a little bit, otherwise it would get boring and stale, but I also at the same time didn't think he had enough versatility to do that, to change up his sound. Uh, but here we are, he hasn't really changed anything about his sound, he still has the same flows, the same voice, and like, I don't know, each and every album he drops I've still enjoyed, so... I guess I'm just wrong about him. I don't know. He's fine staying, doing what he's doing. Because American Dream, I thought was a great listen. I, lo I love the sample work on that album. Her Loss, already talked about that in this video. Great collab album. And then you even had the collab album with Metro Boomin, which I can't remember the name of for some reason. Savage Mode 2, there we go. That was also a great listen. So he has three really good, solid projects in the 2020s. He has to be not only on this list, but pretty high. Moving into the top 20, I have West Side Gun, who for starters has some of the best ad-libs in the entire genre. They add so much to his songs in terms of energy and just overall hype. He's released a bunch of projects this decade, just like his Griselda counterparts. I think Pray For Paris is one of the best albums of the decade and Kitchen Lights off of his newest album, I think is one of the best songs of the decade. And once again, he's just another guy with a very unique voice that really matches his production choices very well. 19th place, I have Billy Woods. He is by far one of the most underrated rappers I've ever seen. Uh, he's released a bunch of great projects this decade already. Maps being one of my favorites. I love the production on this album. You have a lot of jazz instrumentation. And I mean, Billy Woods just delivers so many bars throughout his music. Now at 18, I have Playboy Cardi. Now Playboy Cardi, like obviously not like a lyricist or anything like that. And that is what a lot of this list includes, but I'm basing this off of total artistry. It's rap artists. So considering that, he has to be on this list. I mean, his influence, he's probably been top three most influential rappers of the 2020s. So many underground rappers, young rappers are just like copying him and copying his sound. Exactly. He's creating a whole new subgenre of rap music with that kind of rage rap sort of feel and you know what we saw on Whole Lotta Red. Also, Whole Lotta Red, I think it was a good album. Were there some skips on it? Yes. Was it, you know, once again bloated like Donda, like uh, all these other albums? Yeah, a little bit. A lot of tracks on it. But overall, the highs are really high. You got songs like Sky, you got songs like Over. Overall, I thought Whole Lotta Red was a good listen, but honestly, it's his influence that gets him this high. Also, I almost forgot to mention, but Cardi's been having a pretty nice feature run too with, you know, songs like Fiend and like type shit. Now we're getting back to the lyricists. Freddie Gibbs at 17. He's released two albums in this decade, I believe. Alfredo, which is a great listen, and then Soul so Sold Separately, something like that. I'm kind of blanking on the name a tiny bit. Um, that one I did not enjoy as much. I thought it got a little boring. Also, it just, it doesn't stand up to Alfredo at all, not even close. Um, once again, you got the Alchemist production on Alfredo. I will never dislike an Alchemist song. Like, I, I don't think it's possible, me personally. Here we go, I was just talking about him at 16. I have the Alchemist, the first producer on this list. He is one of my favorite producers of all time. I really don't even know what else to say about him? Cause I feel like I already talked about him throughout this video when I was onto other rappers, but that's just because he was involved in so many different projects already this decade. One of those being Alfredo, one of those being Vardir. And I mean, I, I can't stress enough. Well, I mean, it's not a stress thing. 
I just love The Alchemist, man. I, I will never get sick of his songs. Some of my favorite beats I've ever heard have been made by The Alchemist. He's gotten me into the monotone style of rap, honestly. It's the production that got me into that sort of uh, subgenre. So, yeah. Definitely belongs on this list. So many projects he's been a part of in the 2020s, um, and they've been great. Now I have Vince Staples, and this man is the definition of consistency. Like, really, he refuses to drop anything bad. You have, I think he has three albums from this decade so far. Uh, one of those being his self-titled project, Vince Staples. Another one... Ramona Park, My Heart, Broke My Heart, I don't know. I forget exactly what it's called. Something like that, you know, we're getting there. And then the third one being Dark Times, which just came out this year, and that one is my favorite as well out of the three. Such an emotional listen. Also, the hooks are fantastic. They make for really catchy songs that are very, very re-listenable. I am going back to this album so much. It might be, I'm not sure, I have no idea, but it, I feel like it might be my most replayed album of the year so far. And if you have three good solid projects already in this decade, and one of those is a top five album of the year candidate like Dark Times, you absolutely have to be on this list and you absolutely have to be high on it. I originally put him even higher on here, but you got some great rappers ahead. Now I have Danny Brown. If you're ever tired of music, if you're ever getting a little bit bored, just listen to Danny Brown because you're bound to hear something a little different, a little crazy, a little wild because he's just such an eccentric artist. He's also, in 2023, he was going crazy. He released two albums that were probably in the top 10 albums of the year and that was scaring the hose and Coranta. scaring the hose fantastic production like actually out of this world i do think that was more on jpeg mafia's part and who knows maybe we'll get to him a bit later but uh regardless danny brown was still on the project so great production great chemistry between jpeg and danny brown and then on top of that he released a whole nother solo project that was almost equally as great. Now this one's a bit of a curveball, Quadeca. He is by far one of the most improved artists I've ever seen in my life. It's insane how far he's come from like being a cringy YouTube rapper to releasing I Didn't Mean to Haunt You, which is a beautiful yet eerie concept album, and then Scrapyards, which is a bunch of throwaways, but somehow I like that even more than I Didn't Mean to Haunt You. Quadeca has been able to pretty much perfect background vocals, and harmonizing. Um, he can sing and rap at this point both really well. He's got a great vocal range. He could hit high notes so beautifully. I love the presets he adds to his voice, which help keep the music refreshing. Also, his lyrics get very personal and emotional, which is always good because it just makes you feel that much more when you're listening to the music. Both his albums were top tier. Currently, Scrapyards is my favorite album of this year. It is like actually number one. I know I said Blue Lips. It's because I don't think of Scrapyards as like fully a rap album. Blue Lips is my favorite like rap rap album. And then overall, my favorite album is Scrapyards. At 12, I have Lupe Fiasco. And this is just another case of a really, really talented rapper not losing it when he gets older. I mean, I listen to albums like Samurai, like Drill Music and Zion, which I tend to prefer a little bit more, but not by much. And I just go, wow, because I mean, the wordplay, the flows are so on point. And if you want some of the best lyricism you could find, Lupe Fiasco is definitely the guy. Just missing out on the top 10, I have Lil Yachty. This is another guy who improved so much um, in this decade. Now, I wouldn't say he was bad before. Like, he had multiple classics, SoundCloud, feel-good songs. He was very influential for the SoundCloud era. And I thought the Lil Boat series was solid but I would have never thought he'd be where he is now. Let's Start Here is such an impressive album. Lil Yachty was able to completely change his sound and successfully create a psychedelic rock album. Once again, just similar to Quadeca actually, I loved all the voice effects that Yachty used to give that psychedelic feel. I love the production. And I mean, at the end of the day, he was able to do something that people like Lil Wayne, like Kid Cudi couldn't which just adds to how impressive Let's Start Here really was. It was my favorite album of 2023 as well, but then on top of that, he went on a ridiculous singles run, going back to rap music and rapping on songs like A Cold Sunday with J. Cole, or no, not with J. Cole. A Cold Sunday was a solo rapping track. The Secret Recipe was the one with J. Cole. Both great rapping performances with even elevated lyricism. And then you had more fun songs like Strike Holster, Slide, even his AMP cipher, like that man went on a crazy run. Now in the top 10, I have Little Sims starting us off. 
She also has released like three albums, but the best one was Sometimes I Might Be Introvert. This is a top 10 at the bare minimum album of the decade. If you have not listened to her, because she is very underrated and a lot of people haven't, uh, you're, you're denying yourself um, uh, your greatness, your ears hearing beautiful things. So yeah, you should listen to that, especially if you like lyricism, because man, is she a lyricist. Nas at nine is wild because he's decades into his career, but he's still releasing consistently good albums with the King's Disease theory series, with the Magic series, and that just shows and is a testament to how talented he truly is. He's been able to evolve his sound a little bit too by rapping on these tracks that mix that old school boom bap feel with these trap inspired production beats and it's just all fused together to make something refreshing but still kinda in his element. And that was really cool to see. And I mean, it's Nas. He's not gonna miss when it comes to rapping. Now we have our second producer on this list coming in at eight, Metro Boomin. Now, do I think Metro Boomin is better than The Alchemist overall? No, but in the 2020s, I do think he's ahead of him just because of how important he's been for music. He has produced so many albums, so many songs for himself, for other people. If you really look into it, like a lot of the people on this list owe Metro Boomin a lot of the credit and maybe they wouldn't be as high on this list. Maybe they wouldn't even be on this list if it wasn't for their collaborations with Metro Boomin. I mean, you can literally look into it. You got Savage Mode 2, We Don't Trust You, We Still Don't Trust You. You got the Spider-Verse soundtrack if you're getting into his solo career. There was some villains and more that I'm probably forgetting and just not thinking about. Business is Business by Young Thug, he collaborated on that. And that's just albums. Then you got all the solo tracks that Metro Boomin handed out to people. That shows his influence, that shows his importance and makes him definitely deserving of this spot. At 7 Eye of JPEG Mafia, he is very versatile. He can produce, and I think he is one of the best producers currently right now. He can sing and get melodic, and he could rap. He's got the trio there. On top of that, he's really scaring the hoes. That was one of the best albums of 2023. I already talked about it when I talked about Danny Brown, but the production that you will hear on that album is like no other album. It's completely new, it's completely refreshing, it's completely innovative and genre bending and impressive. He deserves to be high on this list just because of that album alone, but he also released other projects. Um, I forget what it was called. It's the album that he, where he's in front of a liquor store. That was also very good. Now number six, just missing out on the top five. I do have Travis Scott. I feel like some people might be upset he's not higher on this list just because he does have probably the biggest album of this decade, but I'm not really going off of numbers, so I don't care about that. Regardless, I loved Utopia. I think Travis Scott does have some of the best production you could find right there with like a JPEG Mafia. And I do appreciate that on Utopia, Travis Scott got a bit more experimental. I did enjoy that. I thought songs like Sirens were great. Um, you have the hits, you know, like Fiend, I Know, My Eyes with that lo-fi kind of beat into the beat switch. I'd say top five favorite Travis Scott song for me. In general, there are a lot of great beat switches on this album. Thank God was another one. Utopia was fantastic. I'm not denying that. The reason why he's not in the top five though is because maybe some of these other rappers are just a bit better of a lyricist, you know, a bit better overall as a rapper. Uh, maybe their production might not be as good, but it's still pretty damn solid. Uh, maybe they have multiple projects, whereas Travis Scott just has Utopia. It is close though. Starting off the top five is Tyler, the creator. Call Me If You Get Lost is some of the best rapping of his entire career. And then on top of that, he released the deluxe with the estate sale, which I think had some of the most important songs of his career with tracks like Sorry Not Sorry, which just went through all of his characters and um, I guess evolutions of himself and how he was fighting himself. I thought that was a really cool concept and it gets me excited for what's to come for Tyler, the creator and his career. J. Cole is here at number four. The hate for J. Cole right now is crazy because of Grippy and Seven Minute Drill. At the end of the day, were those songs horrible? Yes, but it was two songs. It was two songs and that's not gonna totally negate the historically good feature run he went on, which 
quite literally, in my opinion, made him one of the best feature artists of all time, on top of having a really, really solid project with a lot of bangers on it in the off season. Starting off the top three, I have done so Curry. This man's the definition of consistency. I don't know how he does it, but it's like common knowledge at this point that Denzel Curry can't drop an album below a 7 or maybe even an 8 out of 10. Starting with Melt My See Your Future, which came out in 2022, I was only behind the Forever Story in terms of my favorite albums for that year. Then we got Kings of the Mischievous South, Volume 2, this year, like about two weeks ago, three weeks ago, and that's quickly becoming one of my favorite albums of the year, top 10, top 5. Also, the fact that Denzel Curry can go from something like Melt My Eyes, where he's getting very introspective, talking about what's going on in his life and just his overall thoughts, to something like Kings of the Mischievous South, where he's just creating hype, energetic, exciting, catchy songs, shows a, another level of versatility. Also, adding to the versatility, he made a deluxe version to Melt My Eyes to Your Future, where all of the beats were switched to live instrumentation, one of the best things I've ever heard. Oh my gosh, I I somehow liked that version of Melt My Eyes even more than the original. If you have not listened to that, go listen to it because that live instrumentation production was out of this world. All right, here we go. Number two, J.I.D. He created the Forever Story. The Forever Story is why he's here. He created the best rap album of the decade so far, and it's not even really close. What makes this project so good is you have fantastic storytelling, amazing concepts, but this album is still very replayable, very listenable, very fun to listen to whenever you want, really. The production is amazing. You got great beat switches and songs like Stars. Features, great. Everything about this album is great. J.I.D.'s flows, he has some of the best flows, I think, in all of rap music. The beat switches, Radar, that was crazy. The lyricism, it's there. He even gets a bit more versatile on this album. If you want to go to a track like Cody Blue, uh, I forget the number. Is it 32? I don't know. But where J.I.D. is singing and getting more into this R&B bag. I mean, this album has literally everything. Oh, and on top of that, J.I.D. has had great features with songs like Fuel. On the All Is Yellow Lyrical Lemonade album, he had another great feature on, I think it was the opening track. But at number one... Kendrick Lamar, I think he still has it. I think Kendrick Lamar was the number one rapper of the 2010s, and I think currently he is still the number one rapper in the 2020s now. Mr. Morale and the Big Steppers has a beautiful concept about mental health and dealing with your emotions. Now, is this album as good as The Forever Story? No, I, I already said The Forever Story, best album of the decade. But J.I.D. doesn't have the beef. He doesn't have the rap beef. Not only did Kendrick re release a phenomenal album, but on top of that, he was in probably the biggest rap beef in the history of the genre, even bigger than the Jay-Z and Nas beef, and he won. Not only did he win, he destroyed Drake. It wasn't even close. It was like he obliterated him. Not Like Us will go down as one of the biggest songs probably ever, then on top of that, he released Euphoria. On top of that, he released Meet the Grams, which is one of the most diabolical diss tracks I've ever heard, even if not everything is true. I think for the rap beef and for Mr. Morale and the Big Steppers, Kendrick is the number one rapper. That is it. Let me know what you thought.